a reading from Hosea. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, daughter of Deblain, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, Name her Loruhema, for I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel or forgive them, but I will have pity on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When she had weaned Loruhema, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said, Name him Loama, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. And in the place where it is, it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus was play, praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. And Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. And so I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to go back a few days to the Grubb household when they discovered that they were the readers and the lectors for this Sunday. I want to know... How did you decide who got that Hosea passage <laughs> and who got the Colossians passage? <laughs> uh, Tom and I said beforehand it was it's a tough passage. In fact, as I heard both of those readings read, I thought, why can't the lectionary compilers in the summer just give us the gospel passage? <laughs> But having said that, I'm preaching on Hosea. Um, I read this morning in one of my devotionals that the moment we say no more to God, 
our minds close against the grace of God. The moment we say no more. So if there were a title for this sermon, it would be No Becomes Yes in the Hands of God. First, it's good to be home and back in the family of Zion Church. Thank you all for taking such good and constant care of this sacred and happy community, for making it front page in the Washington Daily News. How do you do that? Maybe I should stay away more often. <laughs> you weren't supposed to laugh at that, actually. Most of the time we were away, we stayed in a carriage house, Airbnb style, owned by two UCC ministers. And one, John, was the minister of a UCC church in Enfield, a very famous church. On the, uh, July the 8th in 1741, the Reverend Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon that was going to ignite the whole of the Northeast into a spiritual fervor, into a great revival. The sermon was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And that's not often a title you get in Episcopal churches. <laughs> After his sermon, 500 people gave their lives to Christ, there and then. The sermon was about 45 minutes long and it spoke vigorously and often of an angry God. <coughs> But fear not. <laughs> I neither intend to emulate the lens nor the tone of the sermon. And yet, as I struggled this week with these three wonderful, well, two wonderful passages in Hosea, I just couldn't stay away from it. I just couldn't. And I felt that I would not be treat treating you like adults, like grown-up people, if I just chose to avoid the first reading from the prophet Hosea because I didn't like it. There was once actually an Anglican minister who stood up in a cathedral to read a passage from the Old Testament that was rather like this. And at the end of the passage he said, this may possibly be the word of the Lord. <laughs> but it's there. It's there. It's God's word. And we know from Timothy that somehow every scripture is inspired for good that we may be built up in righteousness. Here we read that Hosea marries a promiscuous woman, maybe with hopes of change. But those hopes are dashed and children suffer, as they often do, with names and attitudes of doom and gloom. Leo Tolstoy once wrote, all happy families are alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And that family was unhappy. Now these past Sundays we have read about another prophet, Amos, and here was a prophet who understood the heart of God as he just wandered around from place to place, day by day. For instance, do you remember he was out walking and he saw a plumb line on a building project and he thought, ah, it occurs to me that that's like God trying to make his people straight and righteous. And another day, trying to understand the heart of God, he's out walking and, oh, there's a bowl of summer fruit on a uh, neighbor's window, but it's going rotten. Oh, it occurs to me, maybe God sees us somehow like that and we need his preserving power. But it wasn't so with Hosea. Hosea's insight into the divine heart, his experience of the divine agony was thoroughly subjective, not objective. It was a life experience rather than a mere visual observation. Now I have to say, 
it being how it is these days, that commentator after commentator, women and men, all bemoan the latent sexism that many have seen in Hosea. And how many have used these passages to work out mean and vile, wretched abuse on women. That just shows how wicked and perverse can be the human heart. But here there is nothing to suggest that we should emulate Hosea. There's no exhortation that we should be like him. And yet some of us will identify with Hosea. Maybe with Goma, with the children. We find ourselves in situations of pain and confusion and we ask that most horrific of questions, why? How in heaven's name did we ever get to this place? Hosea challenges us to confront, to imagine the divine agony as those whom God loves ignore and reject his invitation. Not just in the big way, but in the daily opportunities that we have to say yes but rather say no, or maybe better, maybe tomorrow. Do you remember those words that we're going to hear soon in the Eucharistic prayer? You made us in your image, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And then again, he yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. As we continue as friends of God, it's our vocation, it truly is, to grow in understanding of how God's heart beats for us and all whom he has made. Now you may have spent enough time with me, maybe too much time with me, to know that a favorite phrase of mine is, it occurs to me. <laughs> I use it as I reflect upon ordinary and commonplace situations. And I try to use it as I endure personal struggles. It occurs to me. The very phrase becomes a, a springboard, a catalyst, a trigger for me to try to hear the voice of God. And even in a way, to have my heart, my deepest being, beat in time with the divine heart. Isn't that what you want as well, day by day? That's why I find it helpful to have a spiritual director, a therapist, that with them I may talk and understand a little more clearly the experiences and the observations of my life. And I want you to know that I'm always available to listen and to share your journey. But back to Hosea. Tom, I hope as you were reading, you were just longing for that final verse. <laughs> Not because it was the end of the reading, <laughs> but because with that Final verse, the sun breaks out on a clouded sky. The minor key, which is colourless, of verses 1 through 9, is transformed into a glorious, brilliant, major key of verse 10. When not my people becomes my people, the children of the living God. And these good words are gospel words. They undo the condemnation. This is the God whom we worship. The God with whom we are in relationship. Righteous ever, yes. But gracious evermore. I want to, and therefore I will, uh, finish this sermon with a poem I came across this past week. It's fairly long and I apologize, but I, I hope you'll find it as touching as I did. It's called The Touch 
of the master's hand. Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it was scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidden, good folks, he cried. Who start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two. Two dollars, who make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the back of the room, far back, a grey-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars? Who'll make it two? Two thousand, who make it three? Three thousand, once, three thousand, twice, and going, going, gone, said he. And the people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not understand what changed its worse. And swift came the reply, the touch of a master's hand. And many a man, a woman, with life out of tune, battered and scarred with sin, is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, again he travels on, he's going once, he's going twice, he's going, almost gone, but the master comes and the foolish crowd never can quite understand. The worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Hosea, Gomer, Jezreel, Lo Rahuma, Lo Ami, all touched by the master's hand. And may that same hand continue to rest upon you and me, our families, our work, our nation, and our church. Amen. <laughs>